been listening so far, and I, I'd like to add what's been said and thank you, Mario, and the helpers for inviting me to be a part of uh, Team Garrett in this very ambitious altruistic event. Uh, as you pointed out, I've been a sports reporter for four decades plus, but obviously I'm not here to talk sports, although I may throw a reference or two, and I really can't help that. Um, but who I am, what I did in my career, I have nothing to do with why I've been asked to be a part of this event. It's because, like the Halpert family, I'm a member of a club that nobody wants to join. I, too, am a parent who lost a child to suicide, lost my daughter, Allison, a little over two years ago when she was 31. Bright, like Garrett, thoughtful, funny, caring, but steadily growing inside her brain for maybe the last 15 years of her life was this life-denying disease called bipolar disorder. I've only had one phone conversation with Scott and Julie Halpert. It was about a week ago, but I knew a lot about them before that because in January, I read a column Julie wrote in the New York Times where she expressed some very powerful truths about our shared situation. So I saved it for, for affirmation in my ongoing journey through grief that the Halperts have been going through and their family too for some time, obviously, the last three years. Julie wrote, she wrote, parents often become immersed in self-blame, tormented by thinking about what they could have done differently to prevent the suicide. If your child seemed to be thriving and there were no warning signs, you think you should have noticed them. She went on to say, despite the agony, my husband and I made a deliberate choice not to surrender to the grief. Wouldn't be fair to our surviving daughters who were grieving the loss of their brother. We need to stay present for them. And to that I say amen. Bottom line is yes, your family, your world is torn apart. So I'm here today to respect the fight they've waged, which has brought all of us together for this very high-minded cause and vision. Uh, early on in my grief, I too realized I had to confront it. I couldn't run from it, like Julie said earlier. I came to accept that Allison really had a terminal disease and that medication, talk therapy, loving family weren't enough to sustain her. She and Garrett had all that anyone could offer them. They had a safety net. They had adoring siblings. They had parents committed to giving them the best life possible. They had great friends like Mario. Whatever it took, all of us tried to do. But uh, despite fighting so hard, having so many people who cared, these two beautiful young people and all the victims of the suicide epidemic still felt, it's incredulous to us, that no life would be better than the one they had. Julie also wrote in that article, she said, uh, Garrett was popular, talented, and loved, yet he felt alone in his struggles. She said, despite our fervent efforts to get him help, he slipped through our grasp. The husband and I had to come to terms with the most brutal outcome for a parent. We could not save him. That struck home for me, too. We learned to forgive ourselves, though, of the self-blame that survivors experience. So imagine the torment of parents who never forgive themselves. And there are many. What happens to their lives after this as much as we struggle? How about them? So all families that have someone suffering from mental illness share some form of frustration. People with bipolar like Allison are wrought with indecision, wildly inconsistent moods, depression coming and going, mania coming and going. Sometimes you think the psychoactive drugs or maybe the talk therapy is working, then it disappears. As a parent or a sibling, you just find yourself in a state of constant concern. You misread moods. In Allison's case, the night before, when in reality she was saying goodbye, she seemed to be in control. Suicide, the experts say, is the one remaining final act of control, and it was another sign that we missed. I do come from the world of sports. Winning is the goal, but to get there, you lose, and in many cases, you lose a lot. What the great athletes do is they learn from their mistakes. They maintain their self-belief. They vow to do better the next day. But with suicide, there is no next day. So I had to analyze my failure came to accept that even though I was aware of how sick she was, I couldn't compete with the voices in her head. I couldn't crush the demons that stole her brain. The girl who had dozens of great friends as a teenager now couldn't trust her friends or people at work. She imagined everyone was talking behind her back. Drug therapy, talk therapy, social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, everyone and everything was overmatched. About a month into the grief process, I started seeing a counselor. I'd been reluctant to go. I didn't know if it would do me any good. I felt I was making progress on my own. But he said two things the first day that really struck me. 
One was that in time, I'd be able to look at her whole life, not just the very end, just that very little part that was all I could see at that time. He told me that as I worked out it, I would see her life in a continuum. I'd be able to enjoy the happy moments when she was charming and funny, and we enjoyed being a family. The second thing he said I, I didn't get or even like, he said, I developed a new relationship with my daughter. I'm thinking, what kind of nonsense is that? She's gone. Come on. We have no relationship anymore. Of course, time proved he was right. And that's really the reason I'm here today. And I think I'm safe in saying it's the reason the Halperts and many of you are here today. If you grieve properly, as strange as that sounds, and it's a lengthy topic maybe for another time, but in grieving properly, you do develop a new relationship. Different, obviously, but potentially really powerful. If the Halperts hadn't, then none of us would be here today. The truth is grieving never ends. But when people are smart about it, and in the Halperts case, have the ability to have others hear and feel their call to action, you can create great moments, great events, and even movements like Garrett Space perhaps may lead to. Look at the power of their family's new relationship with Garrett. All of you here. The events, the accumulation of them, like this one, helping the vision of Garrett Space come to life. Yes, life. So in death, Garrett can be the catalyst to save lives. Uh, Julie said in her article, she said, finding a way to create meaning out of your child's suicide can be a significant source of healing. Well, my counselor called this forward thinking. Garrett's death, like Allison's, of course, it's in the past. And at first, it's all you can think of. The loss is so deep and overwhelming, and you're just trying to hold on. My moment that will never go away was when I was sitting in a Vietnamese restaurant in Farmington Hills. Beautiful spring day. Thursday, June 7th, 2018, my bowl of pho, the soup had just arrived. I was pumped, had the rest of the day free, was off to play golf after lunch. The phone rang. It was my wife, Patty, hysterical. The only words I remember hearing were, she did it. It had been almost exactly 10 years since her first attempt, right after she graduated college, 22, just about Garrett's age, he was 23. It had been 10 years, the subsequent 10 years till that day at the Vietnamese restaurant, but we did all we could do or all we thought we could do. So much of it's so frustrating and difficult as this terrible disease just compromised her. I remember the flood of emotion and confusion that began just drowning my brain in that moment. I remember belief and disbelief colliding in my head like two battering rams. But from the first moment, the first minute, I remember thinking that, in this moment right now, my life was forever changed. I would never be the same. I just didn't know what that meant. How would it change? What would mean anything to me anymore? What would my life mean? Well, with support and determination, you try and crawl out of the abyss. That's what I called it, the abyss, the deep, deep hole of sorrow and regret. First, you crawl out for a moment or two. Then, although you fall back in, that's all part of it. If you think through it, as Julie described in her article, you start having moments of strength and clarity that, that the light kind of, kind of shines through momentarily. I realized right away, though, she was gone, the three of us, in the Halpert's case, four, but the three of us can't lose our lives and each other in the process. Allison was never coming back. And I remember thinking, never is a really long time. It is incomprehensible. I looked at my wife and daughter and said, now we have to do what's best for us to get our lives back. We can't lose them also. Allison would expect nothing less. Same with Garrett. we got to decide for ourselves what does life mean now that it didn't mean yesterday. Who am I now? What will I become after this loss, this terrible injury? We've been robbed of our future with her, but we can't be robbed of our futures altogether. We must change for the better or forever be reduced by this. So you engage in what they call forward thinking. The past is filled with pain and regret. There's no hope that we can change the past. Hope only lives in the future. Garrett space is the future where lives can be impacted and potentially spared the loss of future like we lost with, Garrett, with Allison and the helpers lost with Garrett. In her newspaper essay, Julie mentions what I saw in myself. She writes, post-traumatic growth can lead to a greater appreciation for the value of life, of positive changes in relationships, and recognition of one's own personal strength. Well, a couple of months in, I told my counselor, 
that I felt like I was becoming more compassionate, that, that I would have assumed that someone in my position losing something so precious would be bitter. Say things like, why me? What, what a victim? Why am I a victim? Instead, I found myself tipping more in restaurants. Of course, that's back when we had restaurants. I started being more inquisitive about other people and their struggles. And I, I came to see that everyone had something difficult to deal with in life. I realized that to get back to the life I wanted and felt I deserved, I needed to do better and to be better. I was here when Allison was alive. I fell down to here. I had to try and be up here in order to get back to the life that I wanted and deserved. My post-bereavement level of functioning was becoming higher. I kind of made the analogy like the stewardess in the oxygen mask. They, they tell you to put on yours first so you can, then you're okay, you can help others. Because if you aren't okay, then you have no chance to help others. One thing I read, the poet Ovid goes way back. He, he was alive around the time of Christ. He died, I think, in 17 AD, but he wrote, wrote, one day this pain will be useful to you. Why was the pain useful to me and any of us? Because it made us better people. Garrett and Allison remind us of who we are, where we've been. We utilize the strength of their beauty, brief as it was, to make us better people, to do the most altruistic thing humans can do, which is to give to others. As the literary giant, the late Maya Angelou said, do the best you can until you know better. Then you know better, do better. Simple as that. And that was how Garrett's space was born. The helpers came to grips then set out to make things better. Another sports analogy, if you'll spare me. Uh, Kobe Bryant died last February. Sports World mourned. At his memorial in L.A., I watched the Shaquille O'Neal agonized over how he failed to reach out to Kobe and match Kobe's interest in him following their rocky last few years together with the Lakers. As I listened, I saw that just days after losing his teammate, that these are the beginnings of Shaq's post-bereavement growth. I saw the same thing. He vowed to do better, much better, at keeping in touch with people he valued, letting them know that he cared. He didn't feel sorry for himself. Instead, he saw ways that he could do better. At the end of her essay, Julie wrote, uh, actually, she said this at the beginning today when she came on. She said, we feel Garrett cheering us on through this. And interestingly, as hard as it is for me to say, in the last night of her life, Alice said, I'm good at bringing people together. We didn't see at that moment that she was actually saying goodbye. She was, in essence, saying she'd be bringing us together by removing the burden she felt she'd become. If only we knew then what we know now. Just give me a moment here. I don't know what Garrett's reasons were, but um, no one does. It's because it's multifactorial. It's like tackling shadows. You think you figured it out. I'm sure Garrett's family said, well, he did it because of this, or I think it was this, or I think it was that. And you realize you can't explain it. You, rational thinking doesn't explain the compromised mind of someone suffering from mental illness. In this age of COVID, they quoted at the top, I'll say it again because it's such a stunning statistic, that one in four young adults between 18 and 24 considered suicide in the last month. It's an epidemic and the second leading cause of death for people 15 to 34. Shocking as it is, it seems to me that contemplating suicide has changed from being a desperate last resort to being an option for some young people today. And that's what we're all up against to try and fight it. So for the Halperts, for the Zarets, and all of the suicide survivors, grief is love lost. And the love all of you feel for Garrett has given him the awesome power. He has given him the power to create Garrett's space and be heroes that can save lives and keep the families together. Thanks for uh, inviting me to join Mario and the Halperts, and um, I hope everybody else keeps it together today. I appreciate the chance to be with you, and best of luck moving forward, and I hope you'll ask me again to help in any way that I can.